This is Metal Mike, and in this episode of the 80s Glam Metal Cast, we talk to a metal vocal legend, Mike Vissera. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance because I nerd out big time on this one. Always been a big fan of anything his voice has been on, especially the stuff with Loudness and Yngwie Malmsteen. He talks about his new project, Anime's X, and we go back in time and revisit many of his classic albums from the 80s and 90s. Check it out. Welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast, Mike. How you doing tonight? I'm doing good, man. How are you? Oh, I'm doing awesome, man. Talking to you, I'm excited. Great. Cool, man. Well, hey, let's start with this. So it seems like you're always lending your vocals to like a new project. You got anything in the, in the works right now? Uh, you know, I'm always doing a ton of studio stuff. Um, but right now we've been focusing on a, a new project called Anime's X. You can check it out at animesx.com. Uh, it's uh, kind of an offshoot from the Disney thing we did a few years back, and uh, we're, we're really getting on that right now, and it's kind of like doing crazy covers of Marvel comic stuff and um, different superhero kind of kind of thing. So, uh, but, you know, that's, that's, that's about it right now. I'm just always uh, doing different things, producing stuff, Um trying to think what I'm doing. I'm working on, actually, we may do another Vissera record. We're, we're uh, discussing that right now. So, um, yeah, it's just tons of stuff. So, obviously, you're writing some new material that would go for that project? Yeah, we're actually, um, there's some, they just sent me some music demos. Uh, I'll be putting some vocals on it to see to see what we come up with. So, you know, everything's a, everything's a project these days, so... So let's start at the beginning here. We'll go through the history of, of Mike Vissera here. So Obsession was the band you broke out with. Um, what's the status with right. you guys? Because uh, you've done a couple of recent albums with uh, Obsession. Yeah, you know, we did uh, we did two records with the new lineup, um, a Carnival of Lies and Order of Chaos. And, you know, we, we've discussed doing a new record, but it's just, everybody's doing so much, you know, so many different projects and, and finding, finding the time and then the funding to do the things, you know, um, labels are just non-existent anymore. So, you know, it's really out of the love of doing it, but, uh, we have discussed doing another record. We'd like to do at least, at least one more and uh, maybe bring in some of the, uh, the ex members, you know, uh, I still, I stay in touch with Artie, Art Mako and Matt. I still speak with them. Um, Bruce from time to time, and uh, Jay, Jay the drummer is kind of falling off the face of the earth. <laughs> He's disappeared. So, <laughs> but you know, we've discussed doing a new record, you know, and bringing in some of the some of the uh, older guys and, and see what we get. But uh, you know, it's still a possibility. That's funny you say that because as since I've been doing this podcast, there's a lot of metal guys that have like dropped off the face of the earth. You can't find them. Some people want to talk about it, and some people want to forget about it. So, yeah, you know, just some guys, you know, they they getting into the, the normal life thing and that's that's great you know that's great for them some of us are in way too deep and there's no getting out but uh you know hey whatever makes you happy so so with obsession you guys were picking up steam by 87 with methods of madness you had for the love of money video what do you think why you didn't cross over to be a little bit bigger at that point um you know things things were really going great you know we you know, Methods was doing really well. We we did a, a tour of the states and Canada. We were on Headbangers Ball, and things were really taking off. And and we had a lot of uh, internal problems, you know, um, with with a few members. And um, we we actually had replaced uh, Jay the drummer and Matt the bass player. Well, actually, it was just Bruce and I. That was you know, that was all that was left of Obsession. Um, it was just like a, a lot of ugliness, drugs, girls, you know, whatever came between us. And, uh, so it was really Bruce and I, and then we were, we demoed a bunch of stuff. We, we, uh, we were going to continue on, but, uh, things were just getting really strange. And I was getting offers left and right from, from different, different people. And, um, uh, you know, the management, it, you know, it was just like everything was falling apart and it's too bad because, I think the the, la the record we actually had kind of crossed over to a little more commercial, not 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 the pop metal stuff, but more more may maybe like priest kind of mm -hmm. commercial and 
uh, probably would have been a great record, but um, just internally there were so many issues with the band and and drugs, you know, especially at that time, drugs played a big part of it. It was just really ugly. Um, so, I mean, that's really what, what, what happened, why it fell apart. And, you know, I started getting offers. We were, we were discussing with, with, you know, all, all different uh, groups and, and people, and, and that's when the loudness thing came along. But, um, you know, it was an unfortunate thing, but it just it just came to a crashing halt and fell, fell apart. And luckily, luckily, there were avenues for me. But, uh, you know, it's too bad. Well, you just touched on a great point. In 1989, you had a killer offer uh, to get in loudness. And I got to say, my first exposure to you was the You Shook Me video. And I had had some of the Loudness <laughs> albums prior, but I was like, oh, my God, that that just hit me. And I'll, I'll never forget, I remember getting that album, I think probably for Christmas, 1989, and it just blew me away, man. It, it's it's uh, it's just got amazing songs, amazing musicianship. Uh, what are your thoughts when you revisit that album? You know, I love that record. You know, it was, it was really, it was a great record. The songs, like you said, they were all killer, you know, just, just really, really, you know, Akira, just everything about it was, was awesome. You know, I, I thought the songs were great. Um, you know, the You Shook Me video, we actually were all kind of shocked when it came out because it was comical for us. You know, when we filmed it, you know, there was gir- there were girls in the video. It was, it was supposed to be something completely different. And when it got released and we actually saw it, you know, it's like, what the hell? Where's Godzilla? Are you kidding me? You know, especially being a Japanese band and... You know, it was cool. I mean, for the time, it was cool, but uh, we were just like, oh, my God, you've got to be kidding me. But, uh, yeah, the record was great, you know, and it was doing really well. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of fun with those guys. Um, killer, killer band. How did the songwriting work? Did they just have the music done and you had to write lyrics and melodies over top, or how did it work? <sighs> Yeah, well, for that record, you know, they had been looking for a singer for quite some time, so the music was was already recorded for that. Um, so when I came in, we, you know, we we get we got all the lyrics together and melodies and a lot of the stuff. I would sit with Akira. Sometimes he'd have something melodically in his mind, and or I would have something. So um, that's pretty much it, the way it worked. Um, through a whole time with them where I would write the lyrics and, and most of the melodies and Akira might have an idea too, but, uh, you know, uh, pretty much they would, you know, Akira and Akira was the main songwriter as far as music. So mostly all came from him. Got a favorite track on that album? On Soldier? Oh God. You know, obviously I love Soldier. I love yeah. Soldier of Fortune. I used to really, really dig Long After Midnight, which that one didn't get a ton of play, but it was a really cool song. But, uh, hard, you know, hard to say. You know, the ballads were great on that. Yeah. 25 Days From Home was killer. Yep. Um, that's, I think, the whole record. But, you know, Soldier of Fortune just has tons of attitude. I really dig that song. You know, it's just kind of sums up what the band was trying to do at the time and had a lot of attitude. I'd say Danger of Love has kind of grown on me over the years. I'm not really sure why, but I, I really dig that one. Yeah, it's a cool song. You know, I, I, I actually, I go out and do solo shows all over the world, and, you know, once in a while we'll pull that out we'll do it. Um, but, yeah, that's a good song. All of them were really cool in their own way. Um, so the thought, I'm assuming, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the thought was to break this band big in the U.S., right? And the thing that kind of strikes right. me weird is there's only one single – and it really wasn't the most commercial song on the album, not even close. And there was no real American tour. So what happened there? Why why wasn't there more singles and why wasn't there a tour in the US? Oh, you know, we we, we were supposed to tour and um, we had all that it's just more more uh, political stuff. <laughs> The management had been abusing their power for, for quite some time and we found found out that we were broke after wow. Soldier. Um, there, you know, it's just the management had been, you know, overseeing all the finances and there was just no money to do anything and it all almost ended. And luckily, we were with uh, Warner Pioneer at the time it was called. It was Warner Records and Pioneer Records. And they decided that we would um, 
they would let us do another record, they would fund it, and we would just release it in Japan, you know, and then recoup, you know, then the funds would be flowing, and then we could do another record for the world. But what happened was, uh, as we were doing that record, the label decided they really liked it, and they wanted to release it for the world. So that's why On the Prowl is a little odd, because it originally wasn't supposed to be for the world. It was only for Japan, for that territory. And anything in Japan we would release would be gold and platinum within a couple of days. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you know, that's what happened, you know, it just, uh, again, just, uh, man, you know, management, you know, mishandling our funds and, and, uh, there just wasn't any money. So luckily we were able to continue and, uh, on the prowl actually did really well. And we were getting a lot of promo and we started touring the States and we had, a um, not a lot of people know, but we had a, an accident in Texas, and uh, I actually ended up uh, getting a bunch of glass in my face and, and in my eyes, and, and my brother was with me on the road, and he ended up getting hurt real bad, and we ended up being holed up in uh, Texas for like two weeks, and when the tour resumed, it just became a real mess. <laughs> so it all fell apart, but we were really, yeah, things were great. Uh, things were real successful. Uh, you know, venues were full, but, um, you know, after the accident, the guys and loudness, the other guys just didn't really want to continue and they made it really difficult. Um, so you know, there's a lot more involved, but, uh, everything just started falling apart and that was, you know, that was the end of it. You know, by the time we got to New York, everything fell apart so um really unfortunate but you know circumstances stuff happens <laughs> you know, yeah. just, just can't get around it what was the thought process of redoing some of their old songs from their japanese albums and, and putting american vocals on it was that part of the project that you're talking about that was just supposed to be for japan that was it you know that that was the reason we were like you know i personally wouldn't you know i wouldn't have done it i said no way you know we had to do something more like soldier but you know they had come to us and said let's do this cover record you know we'll cover some of the old 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 uh, loudness stuff and and have you know english lyrics but we'll release it in japan And, and like i said anything in japan that we released went through the roof so um, we were supposed to go back in and then record a brand new record. And, you know, they came up with this brand idea of, of just releasing that. And, you know, they let us do a couple new songs, but, um, it was just a bad idea. You know, it just wasn't a good idea. And I knew that at the time and, um, just, you know, Warner was paying for everything and, and we were kind of at their mercy. Um, so yeah. You know, and, and the funny thing is, is that that record did well in the States. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had it. it was, you know, you know, did well and, and things were moving forward. So we could have moved on from that, but um, it just got really, really wacky. Everything went down real quick. One thing that um, that I wonder about, maybe you could, you'll be able to clear it up. So when you guys redid these songs, these aren't translations, right? This is a new creation on top of an old song, right? Exactly. I'll, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I think in the mirror we kept the title. Right. I believe. <laughs> but yeah. They were just yeah, like hey, do whatever you want over the top. And there's actually one song called "Find Find a Way." Find a way. Yep. That it changed so drastically. The label let us use it as a new song, but it was from an old song. But they were like, "Well, geez, you know, it took on a whole new life." So, but "Find a Way" was an old loudness song, just that it changed so much vocally and mel- melodically. Um, they just, you know, they said, "Okay, it's a new song," and we got all the publishing and everything. So, um, yeah, it's kind of bizarre. So then years later, and I don't want to skip ahead because I want to keep the timeline going, but years later, this concept almost comes back into your career with the Any Metal USA, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Yeah. That was a wild project. A lot of fun. Yeah. yeah that band, uh, great band, and, and just, oh my God, so much fun with that thing. <laughs> Uh, I had I had to make that, that uh, reference there, Mike. I, I figured there was a correlation there. Um yeah, yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. So you do, you do like one more song, slap in the face, pretty heavy. Um, 
Was that the direction that what you were going to go with loudness? If you were with him, you think it was going to get heavy? Yeah, well, Akira was really, he was getting into the, the super heavy stuff at that point. And, you know, he was almost getting to where he didn't want to play leads anymore. He wanted to <sighs> sort of go into the heavy grungy kind of thing. And, and uh, you could kind of see that in Slap in the Face. That was just, that was the last thing we did together in the studio, and uh, it was a single again, you know, for Japan. Get it out, make some money, promote it, and um, cool song, heavy, but um, you know, just that was the direction it was heading in, and even heavier, you know, um, it was almost getting a little bit too dark, some right. of it, and and you know, uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, that song was cool, but some of it, some of the other stuff Akira was coming up with, you you probably, I don't know if you've heard any of the Loudness records when, after I left, they yeah. were really, really heavy. Yeah, they did one, they, <laughs> well, the guy from EZO was the singer uh, for a while after you, and, and right. that album's pretty cool. What'd you yeah. think of that one? Yeah, see, yeah. I, you know, it was cool, it was just heavy, as, yeah. you know, just crazy heavy, and and just, I, you know, I knew it was headed in that direction, and, and uh I wasn't surprised. Wasn't my thing, but um, you know, it was cool. Just, just I knew it was gonna. I knew what was gonna happen, and musically, you know, I, you know, it was exactly what I thought it'd be. Well, luckily, you did a show with these guys a few years back. And uh, any chance that you maybe do music again? Um, yeah, you know, we talk. I still talk to the guys quite a bit. They're still good friends. Um, you know, they wanted to do. You know, when I when I played with them a couple of years ago, it was they called it Soldier of Fortune, yeah. featuring Mike Vicera, and you know, we played Loud Park and all that. But um, yeah, you know, we, the Warner Warner in Japan would love us to do another record and. You know, there's been discussions of us touring, but not as loudness. It would be as Soldier of Fortune. And, uh, you know, Mickey, the singer, is still with them and just out of respect, or, you know, for him and, and loudness is still touring. We would we would do it, but we would probably do, you know, use a different drummer like we did for Loud Park and uh, it would probably be called Soldier of Fortune. Cool. But, uh, yeah, you know, there's been discussions and uh, it very well could happen, but... You know, it's just a timing thing, and, and uh, you know, we'll see. But uh, you know, I, I do talk to those guys quite a bit, and their management and everything. We're, we're still in touch, and, uh, you know, it, w- it would be a cool thing. I think it would be a great record. So. Oh, definitely. So back in the 90s, we all know, and maybe for some of these younger people out there, there was no Internet. We didn't know what the hell was going on. So when you were out of loudness, I didn't know what we were doing. I, I didn't know how to find you, you know, what you were up to. So, But I always was an Yngwie Malmsteen fan. So I then by that point there was no hard rock and heavy metal was not really being covered on MTV or in magazines. So so I buy uh, I see an uh, Ingve album uh, Seventh Sign and I buy it. I don't know who the singer is going to be. And man, pretty excited when I got home and opened it up and checked it out. And there you were, vocalist. So yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, good old Ingve. Yeah, I, I, after loudness, I started. You know, I actually started a thing called MVP, and we. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a, you know, it was a, so, a kind of a solo thing, but I had a killer band uh, back in Connecticut. Um, BJ Jan- Zampa was playing drums. He's with House of Lords. He's, yep. a- he's actually with Dokken right now. He's playing drums for Dokken and just a, a couple of local guys. And it was a killer, killer band. And, you know, we were discussing with labels. There were deals on the table and all kinds of stuff happening. And then I got the call from... Uh, from Mike Varney with Ingve on the line, <laughs> you know. And uh, next thing I know, I'm flying to Miami to to jam with Ingve, and you know, two days later, I'm in, I'm singing for him. So it's pretty crazy. Yeah, and I know for me, um, I thought Odyssey was an incredible album. I thought the two after that were okay, but I didn't think they were as good as Odyssey. And then when we got Seven Sign yeah. and Magnus Opus, I'm like, yeah, we got some really good songs, really good vocals, yeah. kicking ass. Like I love, I love those albums. Yeah, I think Odyssey was, you know, Joe Winter is a friend of mine, and I, you know, I love that record too. I love his voice, and um, you know, commercially, I thought that was a great record about yeah, I think the seventh sign and Magnum Opus they're they were just more attitude, you know, just yep. a little more aggressive for Ingve and um I think it was, you know, worked out really well. Um but yeah, I dig Odyssey as well. I think it's a great record. Um 
so would you prefer one of those albums over the other or do you kind of look them as like brother and sister albums they kind of go together or what do you think um i prefer seven sign yeah, you too. know um you know it was it was rough making that record there was a lot of, there were a lot of things going on with Ingve and different things but uh yeah i just think seven sign was a better record um magnum opus was I think it was a cool record, but it was more forced than Seven Signs. Seven Signs just flew out of us, you know, and uh, Magnum Opus, we were more more on a timeline. They had to get the record done and get us back out on the road and um, just keep things moving. And we actually, you know, we recorded stuff in between, too. You know, there's there's like a four-song or five-song EP that came out uh, called I Can't Wait. I Can't Wait, yep, yep. Then we did some, yeah, we did some songs for uh, a wrestler in Japan and we did a, a little live thing. Then we did, you know, we of course did live at Budokan. And yep. so we were just constantly, constantly in the studio or, or touring, you know, it was a nonstop machine with that thing. But, um, I, you know, I, if I had pick one, I'd say seven sign. I just think that was a really great, great record and, and kind of put him, put him back on the map. And it was just insane, you know, when we toured the whole thing. So, was he uh, was he hard to deal with? Um, uh, you know, for me it was easy. You know, he treated me great. He yeah. loved me. You yeah. know, we were good friends at the time, and um, everything was really cool. He's just he's a little difficult with other people, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, there's enough stories out there. I don't need to get into yeah. it. But um, you know, he treated he treated me great. Everything was fine. Um, you know, I just, at the time when I finally left, I just couldn't, there was a lot of craziness surrounding him between his management, his personal life, just a lot of things were really nutty. And, um, you know, I got offered a solo deal and, and I just took it, you know, it was time for me to move on. And, um, it was just getting too complicated for me, you know, at the time, um, you know, it's just, uh, so much to get into but you know you've heard the story so yeah oh yeah man i'm good um what do you think of uh what he does today like his current setup with with him singing on songs what, do you, what are your thoughts oh god um i'd rather not say <laughs> okay but i, I know nick the, I, I know nick the, the keyboard player uh, and he sings some of this stuff mm -hmm. and he's a great guy you know mm -hmm. he's a great great player and just a super cool guy so um yeah i'm not the negative to say to say but you know, there have been offers, especially from Japan, for us to to do the Seven Sign Tour again, you mm -hmm. know, or do something like that. And there's been offers, but, um, you know, his management is just not interested in in anything, you know. And I think Yngwie's set in, in what he's doing now, and he's the center of attention. He's out front. So, yeah. God bless him. Yeah. Well... Let's go to the next album that came out would be MVP Windows, man. This is one of my favorite albums of yours. Uh, you, To me, I listen to that one. You feel like you sound like you're liberated. Like you're just, this is, I don't, I don't have to fit into the Ingve mold, the loudness mold. I'm just doing my thing. And man, it's, I think it's an amazing album. Yeah, you know, I I just wanted to do, you know, because I grew up on all that. You know, I grew up on Queen, Kansas, the Beatles, all that kind of stuff. And when we went in to start that, we were like, let's just do what we, we grew up on and what you really, really like, you know? I mean, we love metal, love all that stuff, but, I, you know, and I was I was trained as a classical pianist all my life when I was a kid, and, and um, I just wanted to do something real, real musical and melodic, and, you know, and, and that's what we came up with, and, and um, yeah, I, I think it's a great record. I think it's really cool, but... Um, some of the fans weren't so thrilled. They wanted me to you know, keep doing the, the Ingve or, the, or that kind of neoclassical metal thing. But, um, you know, we, we have a blast making that record. I'm real happy with it, you know. So, but, uh, you know, it, it's tough. You know, when people know you for one thing, they want to hear that. Mm -hmm. so yeah. well if anybody that's listening hasn't heard it they it's on spotify go check it out uh especially like something like no more it's very kind of like jazzy you yeah. know what i mean it's a cool song but you've got some heavy ones too that fit into the you know ingve loudness mold like innocent man um you know songs like that and, and the strawberry fields uh cover is totally cool so yeah i love it man I love yeah it. 
Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. There's some heavy stuff on there. Um, yeah, cool stuff, man. You know, just a little, little more. You know, Beatley or Queen or Kansas. You know, just more, more, more musical stuff on there. But yeah, it's a cool record. And you did a couple other ones, like you did Animation and The Altar. So you've kind of kept that going for yeah. a few years, right? No, no, yeah. You know, we just kept slugging them out there, trying, you know. I, I, the, um, the Altar was actually with Jimmy Bell and BJ. Uh, they're, they play in, uh, they're from House of Lords. Um, and actually, Jimmy's playing with Autograph now. But uh, they're, you know, just guys I've known forever from back home. And, and uh, just great players, great guys, so... Well, we would need a probably a two-hour podcast, right, to talk about all the different so- albums you've lent vocals to. I know of a lot of them, um, but one that yeah, that I think is, yeah. is pretty solid is uh, is Joe Stump's Reign of Terror. That those are pretty cool albums. <laughs> um, you know, Joe Stump is an Ingve fan. Uh, it's pretty obvious. And uh, was that the same kind of a concept where I thought I read before, like he just finished the music and he hands it to you, and and, and you just come up with vocals and melodies and lyrics? Is that kind of the process, or? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, he would just you know he would write the music. They you know we he track it, give me the tracks, and I would you know sing whatever whatever I came up with. You know, yeah, really cool records, both of them. Um, I think the second one. I think I, I we actually recorded uh, recorded it at my place up in Connecticut, and uh, I produced the second one. I think I can't remember, man. Uh, but Joe's a great guy, great player, a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, man, you know he would he would come up to music and go, "Here you go," and I would just do my thing on it, and uh, you know, really good records. So when you get a so let's play this one off. So let's say somebody gives him music, and and you write this amazing. Uh, lyric and melody over it. Do you ever get one where you're like, man, I wish I could have kept that for something that I'm doing? Do you ever get one where you you don't want to give it away after? Or? Um, no, you know, I've never I've never done that because okay. I, mean, I always figure I'll come up with something else for <laughs> whatever, you know. So right. I've never really thought of it that way, but maybe I should. <laughs> yeah, because there's so I mean there's some I mean uh, one that comes to mind that's a really killer song that I would have wanted to steal for myself for my own project would be is the unknown. Um, that's a really cool song. Right, yeah. Yeah, there's some really cool stuff. You know, Joe is great. Like, he'll write some real melodic stuff. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of room for vocal melodies in his music. You know, I, I you know, now he's playing with Alcatraz, Traz, which is great. Oh, that's cool. But, yeah. um, the only drawback with Joe, I would say, is that some of the solos were a little too long and maybe, sure. you know, some parts we could have edited. But overall, he writes really good songs, you know, and he plays great. So, um, but uh, yeah, some cool stuff, man. When you so when you kind of touched on this a little bit, so with these big choruses and these big harmonies, is are your influences in that department like Queen? Is that where a lot of that comes from? Or Beatles? Yeah, you know, a lot of it does. Um, a lot of the Beatles stuff, Queen. You know, I was a huge, huge uh, Queen fan from when I was really young. Um, some of the Kansas stuff, but definitely along those lines. You know, um, not so much the poppy. 80s kind of thing but more of the 70s kind of harmony thing um but yeah you know or even like you know simple stuff like a do like a do type thing where it's you know maybe just one part harmony or two part Mm -hmm. harmony single voices but um definitely from all those guys you know i mean they were just geniuses all of them so Animetal USA, this is a little bit more of a bizarre project. It might not be for everybody. <laughs> I, I enjoy it. I mean, yeah. you guys metallicize uh, Japanese anime and TV show themes. Uh, I think it's cool. You know what else I think is cool when you guys throw in, like, the American uh, metal riff that could come from somebody like Maiden or Sabbath, and you kind of interject some of those riffs. That's pretty cool yeah. stuff, man. It's cool shit. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh... – a lot of fun that band. Those guys are great. Rudy Sarzo and Chris and Hell Terry, and we had Scott Travis from Priest for the first record, and then uh, John Getty from Slayer um, and Testament came in for the second. But uh, super heavy stuff, you know, really, really almost speed metal, but um, you know, just a lot of fun. Uh, we have a blast doing that. And you touched on the, the D Metal All Stars, which is you guys kind of doing the same thing, metal versions of Disney songs. Um, are you a big Disney fan or did the project just kind of fall in your lap? How did it work? Uh, you know, as much as anyone, I grew up on Disney, you know, or God, we used to watch, watch Disney every Sunday evening when I was a kid. And, uh, so always a fan, you know, um, 
We had discussed it for a while. Um, you know, we were supposed to do a third and a metal USA record, and um, it just, uh, you know, we were switching labels, and it just starts dragging on and dragging on, and, and then they approached me. They're like, hey, you know, uh, Disney, we had demoed some Disney songs just as a goof, and uh, Disney had got wind of it, and they really loved it. They were like, wow, you know, we'd love you to do a record, so... Um, so yeah, a fan, you know, not, I'm not obsessed with Disney, but definitely a fan of all the stuff and, and, uh, you know, really cool to, to be able to do that. You know, not how many people can do a record for, for Disney. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, what's funny for it's me is, um, it, like I've, I'm not a huge, like I'm not big into like that kind of Disney, but now of course I am like a comic nerd. So I like Star Wars and, and Marvel. So it's kind of cool that you hear that you're going right. to be doing something of that vein. Cause that's, now that's the kind of Disney that's up my alley right there. Yeah. That's, that's what we're doing now with anime Zax. You know, we're trying to do more, you know, more of the U S stuff, you know, the, uh, of the Marvel, you know, of, of the superhero, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a take on the anime metal thing, but more towards the Western world, you know, and, um, you know, Spider-Man and, you know, Power Rangers and all nice. that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, but, you know, heavy, you know, real heavy stuff. And, uh, it's cool. You know, it's really cool. Um, it's, you know, the Disney thing, the D metal stars record, we were supposed to tour. There was a lot of things that were happening with that record. You know, Rolling Stone had picked it up and did a big, big thing on it. I did an interview with them and, they loved it and it just spread like wildfire and went through the roof and you know disney just would not allow us to do anything unless they thought it'd be appropriate for mm -hmm. them and they just held us back um was unfortunate but um you know that's why we decided like hey we need to do this and kind of own the name own everything outright and, and not have anybody dictate you know how it's going to go or what's going to happen so um, you know, that's why we're doing this, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's fun, you know, that kind of stuff. It's just, you know, the kids love it. The adults love it. Everybody loves that, that stuff. So, so out of all these albums, man, we talked about a ton of them. If you had to pick a favorite album that you've worked on, maybe you can't, but if you have, if we're forcing you to, what would you go for? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I'd probably say soldier of fortune, probably loudness. Yeah. I mean, that was the time, it was like a magical time, just yeah. the whole thing, you know, it was just, I, you know, I was a kid from Connecticut, and next thing we know, I'm in, I'm in Japan, and I'm on every TV show, magazine cover, you know, and, and just, uh, that was just insane, you know, really, and I thought that record was killer, and, and what we expected from it, you know, it, unfortunately, it didn't happen, but, you know, I really loved that record, I really loved that whole time, <laughs> um, but, there's a lot that I really, really like, you know, but um, that was just a really cool thing, I thought, at the time. You know what, man? I'm going to go in with the same exact one. I think that's my favorite album that you've done. I think every song is just incredible. Uh, once again, it reminds me of a cool time, me growing up and you know getting that album for Christmas and watching the videos on MTV. And I feel I can I can yeah. kind of feel that that magic too. I know what you're saying is I feel like you were in the zone, the band was in the zone, and you know hey, it's too bad it couldn't even have been a little bit bigger in the states, but still people and you know what yeah. that album's picked up a lot of steam over the years maybe it wasn't huge in the states when it came out but people grab a tape back to that album all the time and say what a great album it is like a lot of people that i talk to online love it so yeah you know it's 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 amazing how many people love that record you know it's like you know i did the monsters of rock cruise a few years back and i'm you know hanging out with the queens right guys and todd's a big fan of mine and that's the record. He's just like, dude, souls your fortune, bro. You know, and they go on and on, and you know, just different people I meet. It, it's shocking, you know. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. You know, within within all the metal bands and all that that whole uh, you know genre, or whatever, that, that record's actually real popular. <laughs> A lot of people love it, so it's cool. You know, it's really cool. Is there anybody that you haven't had a chance to work with that you'd like to? Um, I get asked this a lot, actually, and there's there's one guy, and I did almost work with him, but Michael Shanker is a guitar oh, player. That'd be was, a good one. He's always been one of my favorite writers, guitar players, just really love putting the Scorpions and Michael Shanker group and UFO, um, and I was actually in discussions with him and his management for 
oh God, almost a year on and off about mm-hmm. me singing for him. And this was ironically, well, not ironically, but funny enough, in between uh, Seven Sign and Magnum Opus. Okay. Um, they had approached me. He had seen the Live at Budokan uh, video, and he, he wanted the whole band. Um, and Barry, the bass player, did, in fact, um, did, in fact, leave. Actually, you know, it went on through Magnum Opus. It even went on past Magnum Opus because Barry had joined Michael after that record. So, um, so it went on for a bit and, um, you know, I, I dig Michael Shanker. You know, I know he, I know there's a, there's some nutty stories out there, but I think <laughs> if I did something with him, it would be really cool. I'm going to throw a weird one at you. This is the one that I'm always kind of dreaming up in my head. You and Vinnie Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> it would work, uh, man. It'd be good. good. Uh, you know, he, he writes great and plays great. He's just there's just too many issues with him. Oh, you yeah. know, um, you know, it's unfortunate. I know he's he's there's been you know he's tried to do things here in Nashville on and off, and right. it's always something really nutty surrounding it. You oh, know, yes. and oh, uh, yes. you know, I think back in the day, it probably would have been a cool thing. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, no, this is a perfect world, Mike. Going yeah. on there. <laughs> when he could, if he could get it together and, and, and do something, then yes, you guys together would be good. But I, I totally get where you're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. If he got his stuff together, I think it'd be a cool thing too. But man, there's there's just a little too much wackiness there, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. But, uh, you know, great player, great, great songwriter, you know. So, man, hey, I got to thank you for all the music over the years. You, I, I could say, man, you've kept me entertained for, uh, for a very long time, and I really appreciate it. And I'll keep tabs with all the stuff that you're doing, um, and I'll, I'll promote it on my Twitter and on, and on my YouTube. So thanks for all that you've done, man. Awesome. Thank you, man. Thanks for being a fan and, and putting it out there. It helps. You know, it's, it's – uh... It's tougher these days without the label support like we used to have, but um, you know we're still still at it, and hopefully things will clear up with this virus, and we'll all get back on the road and back to work. Awesome. Well, Mike, thanks so much for your time, man. Have a great night. All right, Mike, you too, man. I appreciate it. Well, that was a blast for me. I have to thank Mike for putting up with all my madness, and he's got an update for us. He's going to be releasing some new tracks soon unreleased tracks from various records along with some bonus remix stuff so keep an eye out for that rock on